136 Griffin Street, P.O. Box 22, Moundville, Alabama, 35474. Telephone number is 205-371-9097. And we invite you to follow us on our social media outlets. Like us on Facebook at First Missionary Baptist Church of Moundville. And visit us on YouTube and subscribe to our channel, First Baptist Church of Moundville. Good morning again. We just want to thank you and praise the name of Jesus for allowing us to be here one more time. It's not because of ourselves, but because of his goodness and his mercy, because it's in him that we live, we move, and we have our being. We're so thankful for God for all of you being here and those of you who are being, viewing via, via, via social media. So God is everywhere all at the same time. As we know, today is an uh, important day in the life of the history of the church in First Missionary Baptist Moundville, and we've come to all celebrate and rejoice in the life of Pastor Bennett. So we just want to thank you for being with us today, and as we come worship the name of Jesus who does all things well. Let us pray. Almighty Father, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who hung the stars in their sockets, and the one who kissed the grass with the morning dew, we just come before you this morning just to say thank you. Lord, we come before your presence thanking and praising your holy name. For, Lord, we know that it's in you that we live, we move, and we have our being. For there is no other name under the heaven by which has your power. We stand before your awesome presence this morning, confessing our sins. Lord, we know that you said if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Lord, forgive us and create within us a clean heart and renew within us a right spirit. Lord, we just come before you, Lord, asking that you would just give us a clean heart, give us a clean hand, so that we can come boldly before your throne of grace and obtain mercy. Lord, fill us with your spirit, that we may be endued with power to stand during these difficult days. We thank you, Lord, for our portion of our health and our strength. 
thank you for the mind that want to come into your house of worship where we can enter into your gates with thanksgiving and enter into your courts with praise. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for, Lord, we know that you've been better to us than we've been to ourselves. And, Lord, we know that without you, we can do nothing. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that you have given us this man of God for uh, this period of time. Lord, we know that for 38 years, Lord, he has stood here on the mountaintop as you've given you us uh, your word and given it to us from his mouth. Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you would just continue to give him strength from day to day, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the tireless service that he has given us. We thank you for each, uh, that he, the time he's given each and every one of us, and especially this church. We thank you for the many prayers, the words of encouragement, the words of comfort, the counselings, the visitations, dedications, baptism, weddings, and sermons directly from your mouth to our ears through your precious sermon. Lord, we pray that you would just continue to pour out your spirit and your richest blessings upon him as he continues to persist in preaching your word. Lord, we just pray, Lord, that you would just continue to be with those who uh, may not be feeling well today. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would just continue to test their bodies from the top of their head to the sole of their feet. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you will allow us to continue to be vigilant as this variant of this virus is still around. But, Lord, we know that your power is greater. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would just continue to bless each and every one of that you have placed uh, above us. And, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you give them uh, your word and your spirit that they lead us in the way that you have directed them. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you just continue to help us to obey the laws of the land and especially your word as we walk from day to day. Lord, we pray not only for First Baptist, Lord, but we pray for every church that's opened up in your name. For, Lord, we know that if you be lifted up, you said that you will draw all men unto you. Lord, we just thank you so much. And, Lord, you've done so much for us. And we know that whatever we ask, you said that you would give us, Lord, if it's in your will. And so, Lord, we just pray today, Lord, and we pray in your power that all things are done and done in your name, the mighty name of Jesus, our master, the Savior. And we just ask this in his name. And all the saints of God said, Amen. Our scripture this morning Our scripture this morning will be found from the book of Isaiah, chapter 54, verses 1 through 8. That's Isaiah 54, beginning at verse 1 and ending at verse 8. And the reason follows. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, Break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, said the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. For thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the, thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, 
shall he be called. For the Lord have called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth when thou was refused, said thy God. For a small moment have I forsaken thee, but with, a, with great mercies will I gather thee. In a little wrath I hid my face from thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, said the Lord thy Redeemer. I read unto you hearing from Isaiah 54, verses 1 through 8. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and especially the doing of his holy word. This time we will have a selection from the praise.
How many saints we got in the house? That's it again. How many saints we got in the house? If you, if you are a saint of the living God, Jesus will the Christ, then you ought to know that his name is precious. Thank God for you. Those who are here in person and those who are watching us through social media, we praise and we thank the name of our living Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ, for he does all things well. It is in him that we live, move, and have our being. Uh, thank you. And we want to say good morning as I mount the roster for the final time uh, as pastor of this church and uh, to deliver uh, the message for, for this morning. I want to thank our praise singers. They've done an excellent job. The musicians and I want to thank the media staff who are covering and continue to cover for us uh, each Sunday as we uh, go live. 38 years ago, who would have thought it? That uh, would stand from this podium, this sanctuary here in Moundville, Alabama, and service would be broadcast all around the world. God is, God is good. I know often we look at things and we wonder, could this be? But I want to remind you, all things are possible if you only believe in Christ, Jesus, who is the Christ. I think we have to learn to take our mind uh, off of self and the things that we see and just be obedient and faithful to the Lord. He can bring things to pass that we would not even imagine. Again, thank you uh, for being here uh, this morning. And I want to just uh, say from the passage of Scripture that I, I heard Reverend Ike reading as well as you did, I, I want to share a word uh, with you. And uh, it'll become obvious, I think, as we move through the uh, message this morning. I, Reverend Ike and I were talking on last night. He calls me. And we talk all the time, and he called last night, and, and he said, I was just checking on you. And so we were talking, and I said, well, you know, today probably will not be <clears throat> the average kind of sermon that I would preach. It would probably be more of an address. Uh, and so I want you to pray with me as we move through, through this. Um, I want to just give you a little flavor for what I'm going to say this morning. And I'll give the title for the message. Uh, but I want to do it this way. When I was thinking about uh, this sermon, I had been preaching for the last several weeks through the book of Acts and about the church and what the Lord is doing uh, through the church, the early church, and how we need to pattern our ministries and uh, meet the mandate that the Lord has given to the early church based on what the scripture says. And I uh, started thinking, so now how would I close this out? I, should I continue to preach that? And, and uh, the pastor-elect had been kind enough to tell me that you'll be still preaching some here at the church. <laughs> so I'll get back on that later. Uh, but I've done a lot of sermons over these last 38 years. I've done eulogies and I've spoke at different events and anniversaries and so forth. And to my recollection, I have never done a sermon where a pastor was retiring. It, it doesn't happen often, does it? Y'all can say amen. <laughs> Usually when a pastor comes, uh, when a church is vacant, the pastor has gone to another church or the Lord has called him him or her to heaven. And, and that's not the case here this morning. Uh, 
God has not uh, called me. He may call me. I don't know. <laughs> he has not called me to another church. But I was thinking, what, what message would I, would I preach and how would I frame it today? And, and uh, I, I thought about Paul when he met uh, the final time with the Christians that was in Ephesus and they were marching out and as he was going to the ship and they were so sad. And Paul somewhat rehearsed the ministry that he had had there at Ephesus. And he said, I know y'all are sad to see me leave. He said, your sadness is due to the fact that you won't see my face again. Well, I'm leaving as pastor, but you're going to see my face <laughs> again. So I said, that's probably not the best passage to, to, to use. Then I thought about Paul as he spoke to his young uh, friend Timothy and uh, ministering and he wrote him a letter he said I want you to come see me uh, he said winter's coming on and I want you to come before winter and he went on and charged the young man and said uh, I fought a good fight kept the faith uh, I finished my course uh, and uh, I said well that's probably not Curtis a good passage to use either because uh, uh, Paul was in prison, and each morning that he awakened, he looked at Nero's chopping block, and he knew that his life was soon to be ended. So I, that's not the case with me. <laughs> I do not see <laughs> Nero's chopping block. And so I kept praying, and I kept going back to this passage of Scripture, and I'm, I'm going to give you just a little history on it when I when I before I go into the message this morning. But uh, it says uh, in verse 2, and it says, Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitation. Spare not, lengthen the cord, and strengthen thy stakes, for thou shalt spread abroad on the right hand and on the left and thy seed shall possess the nations and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. I want to share with you from this subject envisioning what the Lord has for the church. Envisioning what the Lord has uh, for the church. At least I forget. Let me just give you a brief synopsis on what has taken place in this particular passage. Of course, we know that the writer is Isaiah, that stately prophet who wrote so much and proclaimed what God had given him to say to the people of, of Israel. Israel was in captivity. It would go into captivity, and uh, they would be despondent. They would think in many respects that God had abandoned them. And so God raised up the prophet and spoke to him so he could speak to the people and encourage them and say uh, to them, uh, even while they were in their despondency, uh, it's going to be all right. And that the Lord is going to bring you out of what you're in and you're going to come back to the land of promise and you're going to see that the cities. Uh, around Jerusalem, Jerusalem itself, is going to flourish again. And so it was a vision that was given to them that growth uh, was theirs. And so, again, I want to talk about envisioning what the Lord has in store for his church. Uh, we thank God again for this, this moment that he has, has given us. Let me... Uh, thank all of you who have come today to share uh, with us. Uh, many friends who have come from areas and many of who are viewing today. Uh, I've gotten calls as far away as uh, Texas and, uh, and uh, people that I've gone uh, to college with and, and then to, from Louisiana and, and all across this country. And they have assured me that they were going to be watching and weren't able to, to come today. 
And I thank God for, for them. I thank God for Jesus who does all things well. I want to thank uh, <clears throat> my family uh, for being by my side and being supportive of me for these 38 years. My wife went to be with the Lord uh, last year, and that has been a difficult time for me. But yet and still, I know that she's better off than I am. Uh, and I just believe this morning as I stand to, to talk to you that she's in that uh, crowd that's looking down on us now. And I believe that she's uh, wishing us well and saying, fight on, fight on. So I thank God for her. I thank God for my, my family, uh, which has grown a lot since <laughs> the time that I came here. Yeah, so I think, I, as a matter of fact, this young man playing the organ today uh, was not in existence at, at that time. Uh, so I thank God for, for, my, for my family, and, and again, I, I thank God for placing me here. I want to thank the community of Moundville, Alabama, uh, for what they have done and how they have received me. Oftentimes, I meet people, and I don't know if they're just being kind, but they'll say, you're Moundville's pastor. And, <laughs> and I, I think sometimes perhaps uh, they're looking at me because my hair is white, but actually I'm not the oldest pastor <laughs> in Moundville. Uh, I've just been around longer than the rest of them. And so I think Moundville, you know, the city council and, and the commissioners and, 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 and the mayor, I, I think Hale County, uh, I'm probably one of the few pastors that uh, have the county sheriff on speed dial. <laughs> he calls me and I call him, as well as the mayor of, of Moundville. So I think Moundville. I think Hale County and the churches that I've uh, been uh, offered the opportunity to come and preach to during these, these uh, 38 years that I, I've been here. I think Tuscaloosa, the Tuscaloosa community for what you, what you have done, and I've gone around and, and preached there. Uh, I want to thank my pastor, uh, the Reverend Dr. Vernon Swift and the Elizabeth Baptist Church uh, for their support. Um, I'm out of Elizabeth. My membership is still at Elizabeth, and they have been supportive of me. Uh, they have guided me through this process of pastoring. So I want to thank them. I, I want to Again, uh, just give my family uh, uh, my uh, appreciation to them. Uh, you don't know what it's like uh, to pastor church and to have a family. Uh, to most people, I'm the pastor, but to my children, I'm daddy. Uh, to my wife, I'm a husband. Uh, and a pastor has to do the same thing that any father and husband have to do. He has to take care of his family. And oftentimes, uh, they're busy going from here to there. And, and, and sometimes the things that uh, uh, children want their father to do and to be at, they can't do it because of the obligation they have of the church. But, and so I want to thank God and thank my family for y'all. Y'all have been so supportive. Of, of me. Every step of the way, they have been with me. Every step of the way. And even now, with my wife in heaven, my, my daughter thinks she is supposed to instruct me. <laughs> I've had uh, Al to ask me and others, Daddy, you going to move? Uh, you gonna, what are you going to do? And Al asked me one day, do I do it? start looking for a house for you in Birmingham? <laughs> and I said, well, not yet. And then David, what, what are you going to do? You know, going to stay here? Yeah, I'm going to stay here. I said, let me stay as long as I know how to come home. <laughs> I mean, if I have the mind to come home. But then, uh, Kelly, when that passes, you know, then y'all take, uh, I said, we got to do something with Daddy. <laughs> but I still have a mind uh, uh, to do that, my brother called me one day and he said uh, uh, hopefully we're going to visit one another when this pandemic uh, ceases. Y'all don't mind if I just take the time. 
and I said, sure, sure, we will. And he said, I'm going to come to Alabama, and uh, we're going to spend some time together. And I said, okay. And he said, I'm going to take two or three days to drive down there. I said, where are you coming from? <laughs> and then he said, well, you know, I'm, I'm coming from here, and it's just going to take time. He said, how long would it take you to drive from Alabama to Indiana? I said, one day. Eight hours, 12 hours. He said, you mean you still can do that? I said, I sure can. <laughs> and so I, I, I thank God for, for health and, and for, for strength. 38 years ago, I came to this church, and it was on the fourth Sunday in July, 1983. I didn't know the members, and they didn't know me. Uh, I had met the chairman of the deacons ministry and had been given the invitation to come and to share a message on that fourth Sunday. The pastor, Reverend Holly, had been called to heaven, and they asked me if I would come and, and deliver the sermon for that Sunday. They were in uh, mourning, and they would soon be in search of a new pastor. And so I came on that fourth Sunday, Ruby, David, Renee, and myself, and I walked in the building here, and First time coming into this church. I actually didn't know where it was. I had to kind of <laughs> find it. First time walking into this church and first time walking and uh, coming into the sanctuary. And as I entered the sanctuary, it was as if the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, what an excellent place to do ministry. And I, I remember that as I walked through those doors. And the doors, it didn't look anything like it do, does now. What an excellent place to do ministry. Now, at the time that I came here, the church was a lot different from what it is now. Uh, can I take you back just for a while? Uh, when I came, there was steps from here going down into the basement of the church. The basement is still there. There was a little office over here uh, for the pastor uh, that uh, didn't have much room to it, uh, and then there was a little room over here that they used on my left behind me that uh, the uh, choir would meet, and they would have Sunday school there for some of the students, and the choir loft was much different. It had that oval-shaped choir loft and, and, and what have you, and uh, that was the two rooms up front. One was uh, used for the finance or the office for administration, and they didn't have very much at all, and I'm not being quick, I'm just trying to go back down memory lane. And I had been here for a minute or two, and, and I noticed that they didn't have a telephone. And so I asked the deacons at that time about the phone, they said, no, we don't have a phone. I said, what would happen if there was an emergency at the church and we had to, to leave? They said, uh, we have to run to somebody's house. And I just said, I think we need a we need at least to get a phone, and uh, copying machines and those kind of things. You know, they were non-existent. Uh, church did the best it could. Now, I'm not being critical, but that was the finest room. And then they would have some Sunday school, uh, one of the Sunday school classes I believe met there. And they had this room over here, on the other side. Uh, I don't know if it was used for anything at that point in time. Uh, and then the bell tower. It is a huge bell that's on the outside of the church now. It was in the bell tower. And every time I went in that room over there, I was so afraid. I said, that bell is heavy. <laughs> this church is old. <laughs> and I pray to God that that thing doesn't fall and hurt somebody. <laughs> but God moved, and we were able to take it down and, and to display it out, out front. That's, that's, and it's there now. And it's as old as the church, I would imagine, 120 years old. And one day we had a program, and uh, we invited a, a visiting church to come. It was an evening program, like most black churches do have evening programs. And we invited a visiting church to come and, and to bring the message and to be our guest. And we were going to feed. And I think for the first time, I went to the basement. I, I walked down there, and I, I had been told, we got a kitchen, we got this and that. And I walked down there, and I said, my goodness, this is the basement and I said then that we got to get out from down here and again that 
that voice that had echoed to me when we first came into the building, what a great place to do ministry. Uh, and there were so many other things. The church was small. It owned just two lots uh, in, in Moundville. Two lots, uh, 50 feet wide, uh, supposed at 120 feet deep. And you can do the math on that. Uh, and houses existed on this side of the church. Of course, the street was on this side, and the street was in the front. And there was a forest behind the church. And Curtis, you remember that, don't you? Yeah, I mean, you couldn't even see through it. And behind the forest was a big field uh, where people farmed. And the church had no room for expansion. It couldn't go right, it couldn't go forward, it couldn't go left, nor could it go backwards. And yet and still, that voice never faded. But it kept reminding me over the years what a great place to do ministry that would honor the Lord. Then, uh, I believe it was in mid-90s, early 90s, God blessed the, the church to do some expansion. And we still didn't have but two lots. <laughs> and we added the uh, administrative wing home to the church and a fellowship hall that included a kitchen and so forth and, and classroom. And I don't know if I told you that when I first came in, the church had only two bathrooms. Uh, <laughs> and it could only accommodate one person at a time. And those of you know when you get in a hurry to go, <laughs> that was just not a good arrangement. But when we expanded, we were able to put in bigger bathrooms that, uh, and these things may seem uh, simple and uh, to you, but there were major issues. But we put in bigger bathrooms that accommodate more people and what have you. And I didn't tell you this, but at the when I came here, uh, if we had to baptize, we had to do it outside, uh, as most churches. And we were blessed because a lot of churches in this area at that time were still going down to the creek, <laughs> which I never wanted to go, <laughs> especially in the summertime, and snakes. <laughs> but we, we could baptize, and uh, I spoke with Belinda, one of the singers there, and uh, she did I baptize you? And she said, you most certainly did. And I said, where was it? And she says, outside. <laughs> but when we did the expansion, we brought the baptism pool inside. And if I remember correctly, Aldrich, he's out now, was the first person that was baptized in that pool. And so the church was growing. We saw a membership. My, during that time, uh, before the expansion, the church consisted mainly of people here in Moundsville. And it was during a time when people were migrating north. But the membership was mainly citizens who lived in the proper area of Moundsville, with the exception of a few that uh, had uh, been members of the church for a while and grew up here and moved to Tuscaloosa. And so it was just mainly that, that, that group of, of folks that, that was here. And the Lord kept reminding me that uh, uh, what a great place to do ministry. Uh, we, we purchased a, a van along the way. And uh, one day we were talking and meeting and said, we need to establish a, a, uh, a route where we pick up people and bring them to church. And I can remember very distinctively that we went out and there was one lady uh, she's gone to heaven now, Sister Brown, Sister Earlene Brown. And she lived out east of town. I'm not sure where she lived, but we sent the bus out, the van, and picked her up. And she came. She had children and, and grandchildren. And she came, and she became a member of the church and her children. In fact, her granddaughter is operating the uh, sound system right now. But because of that ministry, uh, because of her family, uh, some of those individuals are still here with us now. 
And again, the Lord kept reminding me that the vision had not faded. What a great place to do ministry. And so we kept praying and we kept encouraging people to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, witness for the Lord every opportunity that you have, and not fail to work for the Lord. Uh, the Lord kept encouraging me to, to preach the word and, and to understand that change come about through the Lord. He changes things. Uh, he works through ministers and, and the messages that they are given to preach to people. And if the word can't do it, we can't do it. It can't be done. So we kept preaching, and, and the Lord kept adding to, to the membership. And <clears throat> before long, we saw people coming from Alberta City. <laughs> right, Ike? <laughs> we saw people coming from Northport. We saw people coming from Hale County, down in Greensboro. Uh, and even today, we have uh, people who come in to worship with us from Greene County, Utah, uh, and out of Tuscaloosa. And so the church is a, is a mixed uh, church, and it's a young church. Uh, many of the members that uh, were here at the time that I, when I first came, were seniors, and they're going to be with the Lord now. And there may be a few around that, well, two that I know who are here, older members, and God has blessed them to stay, and we thank God for the longevity he has given to them. But most of the members who are the, of the church are, are younger people, and uh, younger people tend to have a different vision, uh, uh, a different view of what's going on uh, uh, in the church. They bring strength and energy uh, to the church, and I don't know where we would be today if we didn't have some young people uh, who are uh, knowledgeable of the uh, equipment and the technology used to do the kind of broadcasting that we need to do. Uh, God blessed us. We got an IT person on staff who's going to soon assume the reign of pastoring the church, and they know how to do things. Uh, somebody that's uh, my age, I know how to do some things, but some things I can't do. And so we thank God for, for, for them. Certainly the spiritual level of the church and the commitment uh, to the church has, has in, increased. Uh, the church has been renovated. That uh, we now have the sanctuary here that you're seated in today. Uh, we have adjacent to the sanctuary an administrative area that has offices for our Sunday school superintendent, uh, director of Christian education, uh, uh, office for the pastor, and, and finance room. All of that has come about. And then we got Fellowship Hall. If we want to have a smaller banquet we, or whatever, we could do it there. Got a kitchen here. But in addition uh, to that, the Lord has blessed uh, the church. And it did it because members were committed to serving him. It just didn't come about. He had it in store for us all along. Uh, a few years ago, almost five years ago, the church constructed, and now this is almost unheard of, uh, a building, 15,000 square feet. That was a big building, isn't it? Can I say that again? 15,000 square feet. Uh, and with multiple classroom, library, an auditorium that can seat 300 or more, uh, kitchen, uh, dining area, a chapel, and let me just say this, bathrooms. <laughs> Four of them on each floor. And multiple people can go in at the same time a walking court all around the building where people can walk and, and, and what have you. And, and, and then if they want to, uh, if they bring their clothes and go, they can take a shower. God has been good. The vision that he shared with me when I first came here never faded. Never faded. And I thank God 
uh, for that. It never faded. Uh, a few years ago, the church established a, what we call manna ministry, a 501c3 uh, entity where we could do things and people could make contributions uh, to the church through that ministry. And we've been able to work with different institutions and we've received some grant monies to do summer programs for our children. Uh, 38 years ago, our boys and girls, and this may not be important to most of you, but our boys and girls had nowhere to go. Nowhere to go. And they got somewhere to go now. They got programs. And 38 years ago, uh, they had no computers and people willing to teach them after school. They got a library now with up-to-date computers. What a wonderful place to do ministry. And I know you got to preach. Preaching is the primary purpose of being in church. And I know people want to shout to get all excited, but God has called us to minister to the whole person. Are you willing? Train up a child in a way that he should go. And when he's old, he won't depart from it. I just believe that training uh, encompasses more than just the worship service. We got to train them spiritually, but we got to train them educationally. We got to train them socially. We got to train them to respect one another. Uh, I believe when we minister to the whole person, that much of the violence that we see today, young men who feel that their lives won't reach more than 30 and they just got to be violent and take violence upon one another. If when the church begins to wrap its loving arms around people and treat them with dignity and respect and, uh, and then make sure that the ministries that we have Minister to everybody. Older people, senior people, middle-aged people, black people, white people. And we've had white people to join our church. Train up a person in the way they should go. It's easier to train a child than it is to change an adult. Y'all going to pray with me? The vision. Never fail. The church has a community outreach ministry now. Uh, we restructured our Sunday schools, and the focus is not just on learning the scriptures, but applying them. And so often you can take a class. I've been there when I was in graduate school, and I'm trying to get my, get my <laughs> hours so I can finish. I was just trying to get the degree. But you got to understand that when you have an educational program and uh, especially Christian education it ought not be just to finish the course but you ought to want to know what the course is teaching and how you can apply what it teaches to your life and so we were instructed our educational program our, 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 our outreach ministry to our young people to show them how to live and to show older members how to live according to the word of God. Y'all are praying with me. <laughs> we have purchased a van, as I said earlier, a couple of them. Uh, but the church owns now a 15-passenger van. It's in great shape. A 29-passenger bus. Uh, we can go just about anywhere we want. We have a layman ministry that have taken seriously the charge to do ministry for the Lord. We have gone to Ohio, I believe it was, or Detroit and Michigan and different places during the summer to help build churches in those areas. It's not that we're just contained here in Mindville, but we take seriously the responsibility that the Lord has given unto us. Last year, uh, during the pandemic, we did perhaps more 
outreach ministry than we have ever. We not only gave out boxes of food here from the churches, but if there were people who were in need, boxes were placed in the van or the bus and private cars in some cases, and they were delivered to people who couldn't get out, who was, y'all ain't praying with me. The church has taken seriously the charge that God has put on us. Go ye therefore into all the world and teach. Oh, yeah, we've not stopped preaching. Uh, every Sunday we preached. Uh, even during the Thanksgiving holidays, I, I met with our vice, no, not the vice, but with the president of our major, min, uh, mission ministry, and I said, how many can we give out? Can we increase? And they said, well, we've been doing about 12 a year. And that was doing good years now. <laughs> and I said, certainly we got more than 12 people <clears throat> in need. And I said, could you do more than that this year? And uh, I had a number in mind, and she gave me a number. And I said, let's do that. And she did it. And then the next holiday was Christmas. And I came to her, and I said, uh, how many people do we normally prepare food for? a meal and she said x number and i said could we do more than that and she said yes sir <laughs> over 300 people don't recognize that over 300 and i saw people coming to get a meal on bicycles walking across the street what a what a great place Oh, you get in the picture <laughs> to do ministry, mission trips, and then working with our young boys and girls. And uh, we have computers, robotic classes, and we haven't been able to do them as much as we would like to have done uh, during the last year. But we have computers where our young boys and young girls can come together here at Moundville and work with these computers, and it's teaching them how to, how to manipulate and do various programs on the computer, learning skills that's important. Auto industry all around us, and they're looking for people who are computer savvy. And here we are taking young boys, uh, I kind of, six and on up, <laughs> and doing it, and, and then going to the university and participating in, in, in competition with kids from all around the state and doing well there, here in Malvo. And the Lord is still speaking. What a great place to do ministry. What a great place. And I know we, I know we overlook that uh, often, but what a great place to do ministry. I was told just recently that 14,000 cars pass through Moundville every day, every day. And we are, what, less than 10 blocks from the main street? 14,000 a day. And folks say, well, Moundville is a bedroom town and so forth, so it is. 14,000 a day. If you multiply that time, 365 days a year, don't you know you get 5 million, over 5 million people coming through every day. The schools are good here at Malville. The administrators and instructors do what they can to work with our children, and we're going to have to work with the schools and not blame them for our shortcoming. Men need to be role models. Uh, we need to support education, and we need to not send our children to school thinking that the teacher's going to do what we should have done at home. And then get mad with the teachers when the children don't act right. Want to go out and get a lawyer and sue the school. But we need to challenge ourselves, and have I done all that I can do? Well, I know when it comes to the end of our life, we like to put flowers out here and drape the casket and say all nice things, like everybody that died going to heaven. 
And sometimes I've been to funerals even here, and they talk about the deceased person, and I said, well, you know, I didn't know they did all of that. May the work I've done speak for me. May the work that I've done, and we've tried to instill that in the minds of individuals. It's not just enough for me to stand here and hoop on Sunday mornings and shout you. But how do I walk when I leave here? Am I a good role model? Am I an example to the believer? Am I a good role model? One of the most encouraging things, and indulge me now, that I have heard and, and been blessed with is some of the younger members of the church who, who have come in and, and uh, they'll say, we're working in a professional position and we know how to conduct ourselves. And, and they said, you know why? And I said, no, tell me. Is it because of you? Because of you. So you came and you started talking about being professional, knowing how to talk and how to present yourselves and how to dress for success. You did that. And I said, thank you, Jesus. What an excellent place, Peggy, to do ministry. What an excellent place. What an excellent church to do ministry. All of these things have been done. And yet the vision of the Lord has not been depleted. Not at all. People coming through and people looking at it. I, I did have an opportunity to, again just recently. Now I'm a facts gathering preacher. Yeah. And, and some of the members would tell you, they'll tell me one thing. And uh, I said, okay. Uh, I trust, but I verify. I'm a facts checking. And, and sometimes the facts don't check out, Curtis. <laughs> Folks say, I love the church. You know, I do this for the church. And I check the facts. And I said, you don't demonstrate it in your support of the church. Right. I'm getting off my course here. But I, 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 I look at data, uh, data driven. I'm spiritual and I believe in the Lord. But I look at data. And when churches are looking to establish or start a church, denominations, you know what they consider? They'll look at the population of the area. And they'll look at if there's a conglomerate of people living together and there are no church, uh, particularly of their persuasion, uh, then they'll start a church. Black churches don't do that much. Uh, they'll go out and they'll start a church and I look at data, and, and data-driven. And why, why, where are you going, Pastor? I'm going with them. Do you not know that there are hundreds of homes being built here in the vicinity of Malma? There are some beautiful neighborhoods here in Malma. People ride through Malma, and they see just the outskirts, and they haven't been uh, to the neighborhoods. And some of y'all live in them good Beautiful neighborhoods. Uh, I kind of wish I could live there. <laughs> uh, right down the street, there, there are some of the most expensive homes that you want to see. Am I right, Curtis? Oh, say amen. Right here. You go down a little bit further from the church, and there are homes built down there on the river. Uh, people are looking for places where they can live and and if, if you've had any dealings with HR, human resources, they're trying to create, uh, 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 bring people and bring in industry. There are some things that folks want to see in the community. Number one, they want to make sure they're safe. Now, how many of y'all want to be safe? Right. And have a police department that will be responsive to taking care of your needs. We got one here. You may not like all they do. But think what it would be like if they wasn't here at all. <laughs> yeah. So they want to see a place where people can come and be protected. They want to know that, that uh, once they invest in a home, that the neighborhoods are, are safe. 
and that it has some upward mobility for them and it's encouraging other people to move up higher. And then they want to make sure that it's got a good school system. Uh, and we do have a good school, elementary school within a block from our church. Somebody would say, well, I don't, we don't have many young people. Go across the street and walk into the school and let them see you and let them hear what you're doing. High school, they want to make sure you got good schools where they can educate their children. They want to make sure you got good recreation, good facilities for recreation. Uh, we got one of the best kept secrets in West Alabama, Malvo State Park. Beautiful facility. You can go out and walk. And there are other recreational facilities. I know sometimes we could be uh, complacent and we can overlook all of these things. But the Lord is still saying, what a great place to do ministry. And pastor, as you make your exit, uh, remind them that the vision has not been depleted. Are you with me? And it has not faded. Remind them that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. The great things the Lord wants to do for those who love him. Oh, my brothers and sisters, God has not abandoned us. He's been with us all along the way. We ought not think like the children of Israel did in their captivity. They had sinned. They had walked away from God. They thought that it was over. And God speaks to them to remind them that his loving kindness still existed. His tender mercies had not looked beyond their faults. Yeah, but he, he sees People and he responds to their need. He is a forgiving God. We may have fallen short. Some of you who are here in the sanctuary may not have done the things that you could have done. You can't go back and change the past. Well, what you can do is ask God for forgiveness. And you can mark a red line and say, I once was lost. I, I once was blind, but now, glory, hallelujah. I, I, I'm found. I, I can see now. And go from that point forward to allowing God to lead you and take you where you want to be. My message today is that the vision has not been abandoned. God still Sit high. Are y'all with me? Didn't, didn't the prophet say, I, I, when Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Uh, and, and he took a live coal from the fire. Touched my lips. In other words, he cleansed me. And told me to go preach. The word God has not abandoned us. This passage that we have before us today overflows with hope. Joy bells, my brothers and sisters, that may have been silent can ring again. Are y'all praying with me? Somebody's despondent today. Somebody feels hopeless as if they can't go any further. Somebody feels that all of the joy that you once had has been drained out of your body, out of your spirit. But I stopped by today to tell you that joy bells can ring again. Yes, the Lord can lift us up. And he wants to do it. The Lord, I'm not talking about Muhammad. I'm not talking about a false God that so many people worship, but I'm talking about the true and living God. Do y'all know him this morning? 
His name is Jesus. He is the Christ. He is the creator. He is our sustainer. Yes. And he announces that he want to do good things. He came into this world to seek that which was lost. He came into this world that we might have joy. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Yes. And so the message begins. This whole chapter begins with seeing. Oh, you're singing today. So, but I ain't got nothing to sing about. Those folks down in Babylon took their musical instrument, put them on the trees, and said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I want to say this morning, First Baptist, you got something to sing about. You may be barren, but he said, sing, sing, break forth with singing. Here uh, is why the nation was encouraged to sing and shout with joy. He says, you've been like a barren woman. Uh, you've been like a woman that had no children. Ah, uh, but I'm going to fix it. Won't he fix it? I'm going to bring you back. You're going to repopulate the land in which you was taken mm, away from. And I want you to anticipate coming back. Oh, yeah, been and leaving as pastor, but you still got something to sing about. And so the text says, enlarge. Y'all didn't hear that, did you? You're missing it. Enlarge the place uh, of thy tent. Now, some people don't know what a tent is, but imagine it's this building. <laughs> and, and he's saying, enlarge it. Make it bigger. And so we don't need all that, Pastor. Won't they say it? <laughs> Talk to me. <laughs> we don't need all that. Why are you building a life center? You know, what you going to do with it? We don't need that. It's a vision that God has given the church. And so what he's saying, enlarge. Enlarge the place of our tent. Let out the stakes for the curtains. That's the walls. Extend them out. Let them out. Uh, strain thy stakes. The stakes are the things that went into the ground to hold the tent down. And then he says this, you're going to spray it about to the right and to the left. Your offsprings will possess the nation and people that populate the city. Do it. Don't be scared. And so often I hear members of our church well, I'm so reluctant. I don't know what happened if I do that. Somebody's going to talk about me. We might fail. Look, trust God. Trust God. Now, if you fail, are you going to stop trusting him? Trust God. We talk about he can do the impossible. Let him do it. Don't talk yourself out making decisions that are positive for the Lord. Trust him to direct your step. We say he would guide our steps. Trust him. And if he doesn't do it, don't stop trusting him. How many times have we talked ourselves out of trusting God because we were scared. I'm talking to somebody. <laughs> to make a move. Let me tell you. Don't be ashamed of who you are, of whose you are. Don't let the world confound you and, 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 and cause you to think that you can't do it. The Lord is commanding Israel to sing, to enlarge its tent, to, not to hold back. Somebody's been holding back on the Lord. We didn't get over here because everybody was in agreement. Somebody's been holding back. 14,000 people. We got one of the city councilmen sitting here. She can verify these numbers, can't you? <laughs> All right. Passing through the city every day. 14,000. 
And I tell you what the math was on that just a few minutes ago. Homes going up. And you know what? God has so blessed the first missionary Baptist church that there are homes being built right across from the parking lot. Bill, I would imagine, is 50 feet from the church. New homes going up. One day I asked some young men to tell me, and some of the members, I said, what you see out there? They said, I see a field. What else do you see? I don't see it, Pastor. I said, before long, home's going to be out there. They're out there working now. Footprints are being made to build homes. And those people who are coming to live in those homes are going to be looking for a church home. And the church ought to open wide her doors and to come in. But your church has to be a church that's relevant to the time that can meet the needs. And God has given us the vision, given us the resources. He has given us everything that we need to minister to the people. I heard one person, in fact, I've heard a couple of people say this, and you may have said it yourself, but we don't know what kind of neighbors we're going to get. Look at the kind of houses that they're building. And the kind of houses will kind of tell you what kind of neighbors you're going to get. <laughs> Y'all ain't with <laughs> Yeah. Uh, that means you're going to have more affluent people. And I'm not trying to put anybody down because everybody ought to want to rise up, right? And I think that would got me in trouble when I first came here, Curtis. I was saying, you know, you all not just want to work at a company. You all want to run the company. Yeah, I didn't want to just work for the uh, Department of Mental Health. I wanted to run it. And God put me in the place where I did it. Well, he did it through me. But, but you want to write, look at the families. And so the last time I heard somebody say that, Sister Eva Lou, I said to them, don't you worry about what kind of neighbor they're going to be. You just worry about what kind of neighbor you're going to be. Yeah. Open wide your heart to the doors of the church, and the doors of the church to those who are coming. The vision has not faded. I'm retiring again, but you have a young man in the person of Reverend Dr. Albert Ike who's going to take over the reign. And the foundation has been laid, which is Jesus the Christ. And he would build upon that. His family is here with him today. I asked him when he accepted the church how, how did his family feel about it. And he quoted one of his children who said, finally, we're going to have some children to play with. <laughs> They're looking forward to coming. The Lord promise has not faded. He's still king of kings. He's still the Lord of hosts. He still can bring sweetness out of bitterness. Open the doors. Don't be like those people who traveled the road and saw the man who was beat up and left for dead and walked by on the other side. But be like that man who went to him, ministered to him, picked him up, carried him to the inn, and told the innkeeper, take care of him. Here's some money. And if it's not enough, when I come back, I'll pay you. Let people see that you love folks. Are you with me? Don't look down your nose at people. Continue. Continue to follow the vision that the Lord has given. God is a good God. God is a good God. And his promise are yea and amen. He's saying, I know your, I know your thoughts. I want to bring you forward. I want to be a hedge built all around you. I want to be your bridge over troubled water. Trust me. And I know even during your difficult days, when you want to give up, turn around and go back. Understand that eyes have not seen nor has it entered into the ears of man or their hearts.
the blessed things that I want to do for you. God is real. God is so real. He has blessed me to pastor one of the greatest churches on this continent and some great people. And it has been my joy, sweet Jesus' joy, to serve as your pastor. God bless. God keep you. And I want to open the doors to the church. Envisioning what the Lord has in store for, for the church. God bless you. Someone is listening by way of social media this morning, and you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. We invite you to come and accept him now. If you would make this simple prayer based upon the scripture, you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead. Simple as that. You can be saved. And if you don't know of a church home, call us and we'll refer you to one. And if there be any members in the congregation today and you're not saved, you're not sure where you stand with the Lord. And I know so often we say, I'm in the church. I've been baptized. <laughs> but it's more to that. I know the Lord, but does the Lord know you? If you're here this morning and you're not sure, raise your hand and the deacons will come and meet with you and get whatever information is needed. Hey, how can I make a request? Can I make a request? When I was installed here, as pastor, my, my former pastor at the time, the doctor, H.C. Christophe, did a prayer, and he said, Lord, be as good to him as you've been to me. God has been good to me. And I want to add, I'm going to step out for a minute and play until I come back. He's sweet, I know. one thing a pastor have to do sometimes, get folks up.
All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Envisioning what the Lord can do with the church. What a great place to do ministry. Amen. 
And as Pastor Bernard has stated, when he came down, he didn't come down by himself, but he had a help me. And at this time, if you would indulge me, I would just like to read a portion of a tribute that he wrote for his help me, and none other than the Sister Rubenelle Bennett. And it reads as follows. A tribute to Rubenelle Bennett, the perfect girl for me. In the fall of 1969, I met the perfect girl for me, Rubenelle Smith. We were both high school seniors. She was a student at Hale County Training School, and I was a student at Sunshine High School. Ruby was at the top of her class and looking forward to attending college, and I was looking forward to attending school, finishing school and leaving Alabama. 